Danuta. Yes. Okay. So, uh, Danuta, again, thank you very much. And also to Valeria and to Johnny that I have the possibility to speak on NMR spin relaxation in viscous liquids. Dan now, Danuta already saw the subtitle and you see it, of course, a personal tour. So somehow I will also cover my life in NMR in the last 40 years somehow. And so I called it the personal tour. As you can see here, there are many people uh, contributing. So the Bayreuth group and Danuta herself when she was in Bayreuth, then Roland Böhmer, Katalin Gainaro in Dortmund, Nile Fakulin. I already saw you, Nile. Hello. And Michael Vogel from uh, Darmstadt uh, Technical University. Okay, so. When you talk, when you talk about, sorry, it's not completely working. What happens? Just, I have to test, it does not work. I cannot promote my... It, uh, it works. But not on my screen, okay. I have to do it this way with, with, the, with the small button here on my mouse. So, when I want to talk about uh, liquids, viscous liquid, of course one has to ask what are liquid, uh, viscous liquids and they are systems which undergo a glass transition. And we all know that when we super cool a liquid the, and we can con uh, uh, do not get crystallization, that the viscosity goes up very high and we have a continuous increase of viscosity until a amorphous solid is produced. And there are a temperature defined which is called the glass transition temperature. There the eta is 10 to the power of 12 pascal seconds and when you compare that with, uh, with uh, water you see we have 15 decades in change of the dynamics. And this is a spectacular phenomenon and a theory has still to come. So one can say there is a paradigm in nature that slowing down of molecular dynamics without significant structural change. So this is what is about, what is a viscous liquid actually uh, be what it is. And you can say that the glass is a liquid with infinite viscosity. So all these glasses, they are structurally liquids. Only their dynamic has changed. Now, of course, we are experimentalists and we have to monitor the relaxation spectrum upon cooling and a very successful technique uh, is dielectric spectroscopy. As you can see here on the right side, the spectra, six, 60 decades are covered. And so uh, the phenomen you, phenomenon you see here is that there is a structural relaxation and which here controls the rotation of the dipoles in the liquid. And when we look closer to that, we have not yet a full understanding of that. We have nice spectra, very broad uh, spectra covering many decades. However, we, the understanding is incomplete. First of all, as you can see, the Debye function does not really work to describe the peak. It may be better with the Cole Davidson function, but actually this is also not the whole story. You see something, an excess wing, and we do not really know what it is about. And furthermore, we, the role of the collective dynamics is not completely clear. So do we measure single particle reorientation or more collective reorientation? And this is of course important when you have a polar liquid like water of course, and, uh, or other uh, liquids where you really have interaction which are strong. Okay, so, I 
just want to summarize uh, when we speak about rotational fluctuations, and that is what we are actually uh, measuring in our experiments, we may look to correlation functions, we may look to spectral densities, and when you look to the spectral density, as I have defined it here, the spectral density at zero frequency is just the integral over the correlation function. And this we call usually the correlation time, which somehow gives you an idea of the time scale of the relaxation you are considering. And you can do it in a different way. Uh, also, you can not look to the spectral density, to the fluctuation, but you can look in an in a relaxation experiment, like in dielectric spectroscopy, to the susceptibility. And the susceptibility is directly related to uh, the spectral density by just multiplying the uh, spectral density uh, by omega. And then you see peaks here, while you see in the spectral density, you always see decaying curves, like in the correlation time here. So all these are equivalent forms. And as I come not only from NMR, but also from light scattering and from dielectric uh, spectroscopy, we are usually switching between all these representations. And uh, this is some sometimes for other people a little difficult. And this is why I recapitalized uh, our approach here correlation function, spectral density, and the suitability. All they should say the same thing. Now, le let me remind you also, of course, uh, we, we all look to molecular reorientation and dielectric spectroscopy, depolarized light scattering, and NMR, of course. They are the major techniques what people apply to look to viscous liquids. And uh, we look to those uh, systems in the way that we consider the Legendre polynomial correlation function. And of course, you have rank two, L equal one or L equal two. And uh, of course, it depends what technique you apply, what L you are actually probing. However, and this is again important, we are in most cases, and actually NMR will be an exception, we are probing collective effects. So we are not measuring the correlation between one molecule and itself, but we are measuring collective, so we are measuring correlation between, also between different molecules. And that's why I introduced a large C correlation function, which of course still depends on L. Okay, so now I come to uh, the actual talk, to the, to the NMR part, and uh, we know that now 70 years ago, everything actually started with the work of Bloomberg and Purcell Pound, which we all know, and they use glycerol to study. And glycerol is one of the best glass forming liquid, the best investigated viscous liquid we have. And it was at that time very easy to get it. You just got to the pharmacy and you get a bottle of glycerol. And so that Blumenbach did because he also realized that only in viscous liquids, he, can, he could have done his work because NMR at that time was, of course, really at very low frequencies, you see here. And you can study those features which are coming out from the BPP equation only in viscous liquids. Anyway, he plugged in a, a, what we call a Debye or a Lorentzian, which is nothing else than the, that the dipolar correlation function is exponential. And so he put it in and he looked to the forecast of the, of the equation. He basically could reproduce the qualitative features. However, you can see there are deviations. It's very difficult for me because my computer does not work. I have to do that by the mouse. 
that's a pity. So here we go. And uh, so the, the, it works qualitatively, but uh, we have deviation as it is seen here. And uh, so it may be that the correlation function we are actually have to introduce into the BPP equation are non-exponential. And so it was completely clear from the very beginning that we need measuring more frequencies. What we actually want to do is we want to measure many, many frequencies and then get uh, the R of omega, R1 of omega, and finally by Fourier transformation, by, uh, we get the correlation function, which later may be explained by the theoreticians. Okay, so 20 years passed without big progress in the field. Only in 1971, the work of Noack made impressive contribution. They measured the spin lattice relaxation between 10 kilohertz and roughly 120 megahertz. This is really impressive data and we still today have problems to cover uh, such a large frequency range. And uh, they were testing the relevance of molecular rotation versus translation. And they came up with the conclusion that all these data can be nicely fitted uh, with the translation random walk model. What it is is not so important at the moment. The, big, the point is we still have uh, deviations. We have deviations at high and at low temperatures. Uh, remember that here the T1 is plotted as a function of reciprocal temperature. And the big question is, of course, where are the rotations? When you look to NMR, to the interaction, you would expect that the closest instances are, of course, within the molecule, the closest distance thus between the proton pairs, and they should show up somewhere in the relaxation. But that was not the conclusion of NOAA. So we go a few years later, we have to mention the work by Kinzinger and Zeitler, and they did something which uh, was, of course, uh, completely con uh, uh, logic, they tried to decompensate uh, due to separate the inter and the intramolecular relaxation. And they did that by isotope dilution. And what they found is that the inter part can be described by a Cole Davidson distribution as for dielectric spectra, I told you before. And so it became clear somehow that the correlation function involved in NMR is indeed like that in the dialectic spectroscopy non-exponential. And then they made a statement that the interpart could not be explained by the Tory work. So again, the situation was only partly clarified. Okay, so I recapitalized uh, the, the drawbacks of conventional NMR relaximetry, and it was clear except for the work, actually the unique work, it was never really repeated the work of Noack, I think, making conventional uh, relaxation measurements at very, very different uh, very different frequency using many, many different uh, spectrometers. So actually most of the people uh, did only a few fre uh, frequencies. And so we have no chance really to get the spectral density. And next, of course, we have to, what I already uh, indicated, that the role of intra and intra is unknown. So clearly the total relaxation is the sum of intra and inter. And the intra is of course dominated by rotation. But now, and I will come back to that, the, the intermolecular part is, dom is um, controlled by translation and rotation. So you easily can imagine if you have non-spherical molecule, what most of the mo basic all molecules are non-spherical, 
you have, when you rotate the molecule and the spin pair, the protons are on different molecules, the inter part contains also or uh, modulates uh, the, uh, the rotation modulates the inter part. Okay, so one has to say at that time people were a little disappointed by proton NMR and people switch to other nuclei like uh, deuterons uh, looking to the quadrupolar relaxation and in that case we know for sure that the molecules uh, that the that NMR probes reorientation of the molecular systems only and this is of course a nice uh, much better situation in certain aspects and when I was in at my time during my PhD there with Hans Celesto there was also Wolfgang Spies and he was always advocating uh, deuteran NMR and he told me go to deuterans and leave protons actually in my diploma work I did still did proton NMR doing isotope dilution with polymers okay I and I indeed followed his, his, his advice in the sense that we together Hans Celesto and me as, a P, as his PhD student, we measured toluene deuterated. So toluene is a very small molecule and actually it can be super cooled easily. And here you see the results differently deuterated toluene. The point was here that we measured T1 and T2 and we took the coupling constant from the solid state spectrum and all this together made it possible that we could get coherently the correlation times and you see how much we can cover and we go deep into the viscous uh, regime of the liquid and so we could do that again by assuming a Cole Davidson uh, spectral density like for proton uh, intrapart and like for dielectric spectroscopy. And um, so this was somehow a new idea measuring T2 and T1 and don't discuss the coupling constant, just put it in as you measure from low temperature spectra. Okay, so this was continued in a much more complete study by again uh, the Celeste group and the diploma work of Thomas Dries uh, made uh, again very nice measurements uh, of T1 and T2 and you can see how you can measure T2 almost reaching one microsecond and starting at high temperatures close to a second. So uh, he did that and he got the correlation uh, times and they all agreed between T1 and T2 and they even agreed with the viscosity. However, there are still deviations close to TG, so at 88 we still did not understand completely even the Druton relaxation. So you see here these features, they are unclear and they could not be explained by uh, assuming a cold Davidson distribution. Okay, so I did not completely follow the advice of Wolfgang Spies because in 2004 I bought a Stella field cycling machine and we had a long-standing collaboration also with the Darmstadt group which have a machine which is even uh, a little broader or significantly broader actually and recently uh, the Darmstadt people reached even three hertz as a low frequency limit. Of course when you do that you have to apply earth field uh, compensation. Okay, so I was back to, to proton NMR, proton rel relaxometry. And of course, we started actually not with viscous liquids, we started with polymers. Okay, they are also viscous, but polymers are, is another story. But simultaneously, I said we have to revisit the old candidate glycerol. And here you see the dispersion uh, of uh, glycerol, what you can do with the stellar machine, R1 
as a function of frequency. And what you see, we covered uh, a lot of uh, temperatures and you see we have strong dispersion. And when you look closer, you may even speculate, look to that line here, that uh, we have a bimodal uh, character of the dispersion. So now we uh, did something which is not so often done in, uh, in NMR, but which you can do because I told you at the beginning, we can do present the data in the suitability representation. Okay, so let's do it. We, can, we multiply now the, the uh, rate with omega and we get something what I now call for the following the NMR suitability. I told you, you can do that, uh, this representation to, to the fluctuation dissipation theory. And you see now we have peaks here which are shifting to lower frequencies uh, while we supercool the systems. However, they look all, the, the curves look very similar. And so one thinks one can come to a, it's very difficult to handle my, my mouse. Uh, and, and so we are now shifting all the spectra together to get a master graph. And when you do this, one usually speaks about that you apply frequency temperature superposition. And when you, when you look to the, to, the, to the spectrum, you see uh, that indeed it works nicely. And it is, uh, we see clearly a shoulder in the spectra. And so something is strange in a proton NMR and uh, we have to, to think about that. Uh, before that, we looked to the time constant, and now this is important. In order to check the reliability of our master curve construction, we extracted from the NMR spectra the time constant, we, and we compare that to what other people have done uh, with their techniques. And here you see in black the literature data, and in colored you see what we got uh, from NMR. And so we find nice agreement and uh, we see that the time constant do not follow an Arrhenius behavior, uh, but what is called a non-Arrhenius behavior. And this is actually typical for the glass transition. I told you at the beginning, OTP in autodefinition, the viscosity almost diverges. And this is here uh, again seen. So everything looks nice we are justified to apply this master curve construction. Now, let's compare the spectra to that of the literature. Before it was only the time constant, now we look to the spectra. And when you look here to the figure, you see the green and the blue is actually due to field cycling. In rare cases, you can do that. And you see that the proton does not fit on the low frequency side. So this low frequency, so low frequency shoulder is not seen by deuteron and not by dielectrics. So the question is, what, from where does it come? So immediately, and actually it was Danuta who pushed, pushed us to look for this uh, solution, uh, that it might be intermolecular of inner origin. And so we did what every people in that case do. They make an isotope dilution, but I think we did it for the first time for the frequency dependent uh, data. So we looked to the frequency dependent of the dispersion spectra. And they should be linear in terms that the inter part goes down linear with the concentration. And when you look to the limit at zero concentration when all the different molecules, actually I did not say what the experiment is clearly done, what is done there, you mix glycerol, protonated glycerol with deuterated counter, uh, counter molecules. And so you can dilute the protonated glycerol and at the end you get the intra -pump. 
Okay, and here you see the results on the right side. You see why diluting this shoulder here disappears. And uh, so clearly the shoulder reflects intermolecular relaxation, but as it is somehow clear, intermolecular relaxation first of all probes translational motion of the molecule. And the intra part here in yellow can be nicely fitted by a Cole Davidson function. So uh, again, uh, we have the results of what we know from deuterons, from dielectric, and everything is consistent. But the new insight we get is now that rotation and translation contributions are separated in, in the rate. And uh, this uh, I show you, before I go into details here, I show you also the inter part and the intermolecular part which was isolated by the dilution experiment. This inter part has a funny feature. It's not only translation. It is, has also a rotational contribution, the intermolecular relaxation. So, as I told you before, rotation also leads to intermolecular effects, and this is actually called eccentricity effect. Okay, so now, okay, one can say that we later apply this formula that the inter relaxation contains actually two pieces, the translation part and the intermolecular rotational part. This will be applied later by us. Now, let's summarize it again. So, rotation and translation contributions are spectrally separated and trans dominates at low frequency. Actually, when you look to the Abraham book, there was already as written down there that tau trans is nine times longer than tau what when you assume a Stoke Einstein uh, the bi relation. What it means that you assume a hydrodynamic model that the molecule is a sphere in the viscous medium undergoing rotational diffusion and translation diffusion. So it was already written in the Abraham book that the translation should concentrate or should uh, dominate at low frequencies. Now, when this is clear, we can remember one exact piece of knowledge. And this is that the long time behavior of the translational correlation function is actually given by function, uh, represents function diff Fitian diffusion. So we can express the translational correlation function at long times with a power law dependence t to the power of minus three half. And immediately you get the frequency domain representation, which is nothing else than the universal square root law at low omega. And you see what appears here as a prefactor is the diffusion coefficient. So we can measure diffusion and we will exploit that uh, very in, in a few seconds before I show you when we have master curves, we can fully transform. Master curves means we have many, many decades uh, over the frequency. We can transform the spectral density into the dipolar correlation function and you see here the results. You see, we measure five decades. We cover five decades in amplitude and many decades in time. And we see that it is bimodal because we have, in, we have rotation and translation. And moreover, we see the long time power law directly in the data. We see the power law. And now it should be clear that the correlation function is not simple, simply exponential or even not simply stretched in protons. It's a mixture of, of two things, at least, rotation and translation. And one is completely non-debile 
in the sense that it's actually a power law. And so uh, this is a direct demonstration. And we, if in the group of Michael Vogel, the people are doing nice simulation work and they made atomistic simulations. And these atomistic simulations show the same long time behavior and the same bimodal structure. And you, of course, uh, can imagine that this power law will always survive at long times with respect to the rotational contribution. And this is why at low frequencies, long time, low frequencies, uh, you have the dominance of the uh, translational diffusion in proton NMR relaxation. Okay, so we exploited that. We plotted the relaxation rate as a function of square root omega, and we uh, look to the linear part at low frequencies, and we look to the diffusion uh, coefficient, and we compare that uh, with what is so far or was so far the gold standard in diffusion measurements in liquids, and that is, of course, field gradient NMR. And here, the open symbols, the small ones, are the data from field gradient NMR, and uh, the full symbols are from, from uh, proton relaxation. Okay. Only quickly, you can uh, want to say something that you can, if this universal low frequency limits apply, so you can get a master curve in the spectral density representation at low frequency. And this is an exact law. All data have to collapse at low frequency to that linear slope, which is nothing else than this equation. And uh, this, of course, means we have no extreme narrowing condition in the, in the naive way in proton NMR because you always have this law. Okay, so you see you can do master curves also in other representations. Okay, now I want to come back to glycerol again. Glycerol is not finished. Uh, we still have features which are not understood. Okay, this is now done with the home build machine in uh, Darmstadt. And now we measure glycerol down to low temperature, down to the glass transition temperature. And this means we actually go with the field cycling relaxometer into the solid state. So one crosses over to the solid state and by that the FID becomes Gaussian and very short. And most of the community of field uh, cycling NMR, they do not measure further because actually it's difficult to find the FID. But of course you can do it and we did it, it we did it in, even in Bayreuth and uh, the people in Darmstadt did it. And the result is here you now presented in the suitability representation, the Susceptibility becomes very flat on uh, low uh, at low frequencies and, uh, and at low temperature. Sorry, and um, so let's look that in detail. Now, this is a very uh, important point that this is understood because we do now we will now again apply a certain rescaling, but which is little different than the one we used before. Okay, so imagine you measure in a field cycling experiment actually a three-dimensional data set. And this three-dimensional data set uh, as a function of omega and t, r1 as a function of, you can of course also plot as a function of t, and keeping the frequency as a parameter. Before we do it oppositely, we look to the R1 of omega and look to different at those spectra at different temperatures. Now here you see the results R1 as a function of reciprocal temperature and you see all the different frequency which were measured. Okay, so <clears throat> now we do something, we we want always to be in touch with 
what other people have measured on the system, we do now the following. We now take the time constant from an independent source, from light scattering, for example, for glycerol, and we plot the, the, now the susceptibility, R1 multiplied by omega, as a function of tau alpha. So when you look to the, you compare those two, not much different. The only thing is that all the relaxation maxima are more or less by definition the same height, show the same height. But now we do something, we are not shifting data. We are just now rescaling the tau axis by omega. Omega is the Lama frequency. We have listed here. So now we just have the suitability function as a, uh, uh, suitability as a function of omega tau. And we get a master curve. So rescaling reveals a master curve. We do not shift spectra, it just happens. This is maybe strange for you. So there is no shifting involved. There's no enforcing involved. If FTS applies frequency temporal superposition, you have to get this result. So this is uh, an important point. And now we go uh, to other data we have on glycerol. We have measured glycerol H8. Actually, the one before was glycerol H5. And uh, also Noak, uh, as you know, he measured also HI8, uh, glycerol H8. And so we all put uh, that together and we got, just by rescaling, we got a master curve. And as before, we see the low frequency shoulder here due to translation and motion. But now we see something new. We see this, what is called actually the axis wing. Remember, we have seen that before at the beginning and I show you the dialect results before. So qualitatively, this spectrum here is very similar to the spectrum here. You see that dialectic spectroscopy usually stops on the left side because nothing is expected there. There is no longer uh, dipolar, uh, um, dipole orientation here in, uh, on that side. However, in proton NR you have the translation. So this is why we go so low in the amplitude of the sensibility. So indeed we have rediscovered qualitatively all the features which other people from other techniques do observe in their relaxation spectrum. Okay, we tested that for other systems, for uh, pro uh, propylene glycol, and uh, here the data in, as a function of temperature and later we scale. No shifting involved and different colors are different frequencies. Okay, so now um, what you see here is that you don't see this excess wing feature and this is clear because the pure student, he stopped to measure to lower temperatures because he lost his signal and he was unexperienced to find it again. But anyway, we have for high temperatures, we again confirm the master curves. Uh, so now we are finally in the condition to describe the full relaxation spectrum and as you and describing it quantitatively. And we, as before, we have a sum of intra and inter. And the rotation, we now substitute that by saying we have a rotational part and we have a translational part. And this rotational part is actually the sum of the intra part and what I call the eccentricity effect, uh, the rotational part induced or mediated or uh, coming from the intermolecular relaxation. So we describe this rotational part by a Cole Davidson as before. However, in order to include this excess wing, we just phenomenal, phenomenally 
we included a second Cole Davidson function. And remember now, when as a as a as doing relaxometry, we of course our first goal is really to describe the spectral density. First, without saying what is exactly the background of this feature. And I told you at the beginning that the excess wing could be a secondary relaxation. So the, seeing a spectrum does not mean that different parts belong to the same motional process. So here we think this is a secondary relaxation. This is the overall reorientation of the molecule. And here, this is a translation. And now, how do we describe the translation? Of course, this is well known now. We use the, the force, uh, the force free heart sphere model developed by Wang and Fried and Ayo and others. And uh, the point is that there are uh, a few ingredients, and one is the spin density, and then there is a distance of closes approach. And of course, there is the diffusion uh, coefficient. And um, so we, we all get that from this uh, last cross and we get it, uh, of course, uh, also in, as a function of uh, temperature and certain range. Okay. Now, when you look to a different system, we focus on glycerol. And uh, of course, there are many glass forming liquids, many viscous liquids. And um, when you do uh, this analysis, you will see uh, certain differences. And the one thing you learn from your master curves that there is a certain separation between translation and rotation. And this is done or uh, specified by the ratio tau trans over tau what. And this uh, ratio, which I, we usually call R ratio, is given by the d squared over the hydrodynamic radius again squared. So you immediately see if d is R, you get the number nine for this ratio. So you immediately see in the case of glycerol, the R is anomalously high. Consequently, the hydrodynamic ratio is extremely unphysically small. So this means nothing else than that Stone-Einstein, the bio-relations fail. And actually, this is known since a while that it fails for glycerol. When you look to uh, Zilesco work, there is a publication where they are also surprised of the not well working SED in the case of glycerol. But now when we look to, oh, before we go to another system, I again can you can refer to the recent simulation work. And in this simulation, we simulated both uh, deuterate systems and in, of glycerol. Uh, and uh, you see these points here. And their experiment is here. We have a slight difference between the two differently labeled uh, uh, glycerol molecules. And uh, the important point is the high R value is confirmed by the MD simulation. Actually, one could say people did not really believe that this is the case that that the R value is so large that we can really see the two relaxation processes in the spectrum, I could convince uh, Michael Vogel that he uh, conducted this uh, study together with his students and uh, we, the simulation confirmed these results. So of course in that simulation you have to do a uh, simulation uh, going over a very large uh, sphere of interactions uh, to include the intermolecular um, relaxation contributions. Okay, so now I come to another system and uh, autotafenyl is uh, another well-studied class from us and surprise, we do not see a discernible shoulder. So 
the, the explanation is very simple. In the case of OTP, the stokes einstein debye relations applies and uh, the, the ratio is only nine. And if the ratio is nine and you see the shoulder is actually not high, then you do not really see uh, such a uh, low frequency shoulder. That's possibly the reason why this feature of intermolecular relaxation, what somehow was overlooked in the literature. Of course, people tried to test the low frequency limits already in the 50s, uh, but of course they had only a few frequencies. Anyway, we now could recom uh, recommend to use these R values as a measure of association in the liquids because it is clear that glycerol is a hydrogen binding system and OTP is not. Now, I come now and uh, I always like FTS, you, you can see that. <laughs> and let's look to the consequences of FTS and actually we already applied these consequences. But you can apply that in a little different way again now. The point is, you can measure the sensibility as a function of tau or as a function of omega. It does not matter whether what you are doing as a function of omega or as a function of tau, what you get from an independent source. Okay, so let's apply that to deuteron data. Deuteron T1 of glycerol measured at a single frequency. And we have, when we have the tau, we can convert that to the sensibility. So let's convert it to first to the time, to the uh, correlation times. And then we make the, the, the conversion to the uh, sensibility representation. And now you see the spectra. And it looks already like the feature we have seen before, the, spec, the sensibility spectra with all the features we know it should have, excess wing, peak, etc. Of course, in deuterans, you have no, no low frequency shoulder. And now we compare that with our proton results. And we see the same, the same uh, uh, high frequency uh, data and uh, we have nice agreement. So imagine once again, we measured at the single frequency and we get the spectra which have been people obtained from proton NMR measuring many spectra and producing this master. So life gets easy again. So now we compare that with our results we had before with our different proton results, H8, H5, and now we have D5, D3, and you see basically we have the same feature of uh, the relaxation spectra. So, and we have again the evidence of this excess wing. And as said before, we have no low frequency contribution in deuterons. Okay, now just for giving you a warning I also want to show you a situation where, where you may see that FTS fails, or we should better say not FTS fails, but the data do not collapse as it, they should be for a certain reason, which we immediately will understand. Okay, so here is the relaxation data of toluene measured by uh, Deuteron NMR, actually this is a work of, um, of um, myself, I think, and, <laughs> and I also think of uh, Gerhard Hinze, I'm sorry I did not cite him here. And uh, so we have almost, we have a master curve essentially at high frequency. But now let's go to the proton data. You see the proton data they are at low fields. Deuteron is at high fields. 
And now you see, we don't get a master curve. It's completely disrupted. And you see only at very high temperatures, which refers to high frequencies on the left side in deuterium relaxation. So we nicely see it does not work. But this is not that it, that it means that for the reorientation of the molecule, for the over-orientation of the molecule, you, the FTS does not apply. It means there is a sec another process interfering. And this is well known from the dialectic people that there is a secondary relaxation process and uh, it, which is actually seen in the liquid above Tg, which finally merges at high temperatures. And uh, so we know, we can now estimate where we are allowed to assume only molecular reorientation, isotropic reorientation, or uh, where this other process interferes and the, uh, the analysis becomes much more uh, complicated, of course. But this gives us a clear hint of what we have to do in the analysis. Okay. Now I come back, and there is here some thing not at the right place, but it will be immediately clear. Uh, I want to tell you what is the benefit of uh, deuterium relaxation. Of course, I did that already. And by doing that, I'm appreciating the benefit. We actually return to uh, the early studies I did myself. So this is as life happens in science. At the end of, uh, of your scientific career, you may return to your origin. And so we, I repeat what is uh, quadrupolar relaxation. It pr provides access to a single particle reorientation. That means we really see uh, the local dynamics, we see the, the reorientation of each molecule and we call that single particle, or you could call self-reorientation. And in contrast to dielectric spectroscopy of polar liquids, which probes uh, collective reorientations. And uh, this is an, a very um, interesting discussion which have actually re uh, uh, took momentum in uh, last year because there were certain people claiming that there is a universal relaxation in supercooled liquids and uh, that this relaxation is essentially seen by uh, light scattering and by uh, NR. And in particular, uh, of course, it should be the case for deuterium relaxation because there is the situation best clear that we see uh, self-correlation uh, functions. And um, the, the point is that due to set in dialectic, this variation of the stretching, so the variation of the stretching parameter, for example, in the cold davidson distribution, uh, was, was a lot varying in dielectric experiments but in light scattering NMR, it looked as if it is not as much varying. It is universal. So more or less, this was the claim of those papers. Now, I, remember, I remind you what those people did to apply actually uh, this first approach measuring deuteron and, uh, NMR relaxation and using T1 and T2 and they were optimizing the stretching parameters. Yeah, they were fitting the cold Davidson uh, function to uh, the, their data and they in, made the solid state coupling constant as, as input. But um, I told you also, they were not uh, able to understand this feature here. And we know now, and I will not uh, go into that further, we know that because I have actually shown you the, the deuteron data and the suitability representation, that this feature here is the access ring. So now we have understood everything uh, in terms of deuteron relaxation. Now, I go now, want to go now a step further and to um, uh, 
suggest an alternate approach analyzing Dutton data if FTS applies. And note, FTS is proven by proton field cycling anyway. So uh, this was the first part of my talk. And so I always emphasize you should measure T2. And what does it mean when we measure T2 in addition to T1? In a viscous liquid, R2, which is 1 over T2, is proportional to J of 0. And by definition, this is a time constant. And we all know when we stick to the PPP equation and we divide R2 by the coupling constant and tau and the factor 5, we get a 1 and a point 3. We get the point 1 in the, in the extreme narrowing and we get the point 3 in uh, the slow motion regime. So there is actually only a slight change in the proportionality constant between R2 and tau. And remember, we are discussing things on logarithmic scale. Okay, so why not doing the following? Before we did, we used the suitability representation of the data as a function of tau alpha which is nothing else than the, uh, we getting the suitability as a function of tau alpha. Okay, here we had omega times R1, and now we have the suitability. Uh, so why not plot R1 as a function R2 of R2? Why not plotting R1 as a function of T versus R2, R2 as a function of T? Sorry, I'm, I was a little confused. And you should get the suitability again. Because R2 is essentially tau. So here you see the results. We have the extreme narrowing condition. We have R1 is equal R2. And we sh I show you two examples, toluene D3 and OTP. And Actually, you get even on the slow motion side, you get uh, directly the stretching parameter. And uh, you, without any further analysis, you get the parameters of the um, distribution function of the CD uh, uh, spectral density parameter. And you should know we don't see the excess wing because T2 at very low temperatures is not probed anymore because we have, uh, uh, the, we have no Lorentzian FID anymore, no exponential uh, FID when we enter the solid state. And only there, high frequency NMR data can assess uh, the excess weight. Okay, so I uh, show you most of the data which has been compiled, which has been compiled in, uh, in the last uh, 30 years. And uh, here you see uh, they can now be fitted by the BP equation, including a goal, uh, Davidson spectral density. And what you get and this surprised me, we get actually a large variation in the stretching parameters. So it looks as if that this claim of universal relaxation has still to be reconsidered. So what you also get from this fit is you get the coupling constant. And this coupling constant is now a fit parameter and it means it's an effective coupling constant and it may be possible, possible and actually it is, it is different from that usually or at least in some system more and others less. It is different from that coupling constant you measure from the low temperature spectrum. So uh, you get in addition this important information. Now you can do, and this, as I told you, I like rescaling everything. 
And now, why not rescaling the PPP equation? So, these data here, they depend on different coupling constant, of course. They depend on different frequencies. And so, in order to throw them out, you now multiply R1 by omega S before the sensibility representation. But you, you do the same for R2. And then to get rid of the coupling constant you determined here on the left side, or you got from somewhere else, you also throw out the coupling constant because it may be different. You see in the case of toluene D3, the coupling constant, the effective coupling constant is completely different than that of toluene D5. This is clear to you do the methyl group rotation. Okay, so um, we do not see a complete collapse and th this is clear why because the stretching parameters are different and so is the height different and so is the height, height, height frequency ring uh, different. Okay, so this brings me to the conclusion. So we are now after 70 years after the BBP, we can quantitatively describe proton and deuteron relaxation down to Tg in a liquid in a liquid which becomes viscous and finally becomes a glass. And we prove, we have proven that FTS works actually in contrast to dielectric spectroscopy. I did not go into detail there, but indeed there are indications due to the collective effects that FTS does not apply in dielectrics. Further, we have qualitative agreement with other techniques and you here see once again uh, the dielectric spectra. And uh, one very important information is of course intermolecular contribution must not be ignored. Actually, it's the big advantage of proton NMR that we know at low frequencies we see the translation and relaxation. We see translation via the intermolecular relaxation. Okay, we can quantitatively describe uh, all these factors. I'm not going into uh, details. And uh, so uh, the last point is uh, that uh, we, uh, we, when you refer to quadrupolar relaxation, we are addressing rather stretching, stretching of a simple particle rotation in the liquid. And the best way or one way to do it, just plot R1 versus R2. Okay, I'm not at the end of the talk. So there is still one uh, uh, transparency I want to show to you. And uh, so what are the perspectives we have in our relaxometry in viscous liquid? And first one can say with the progress of instrumentation and the help of FTS, I'm emphasizing with the help of FTS, NMR relaxometry allows a full uh, access of uh, the full relaxation uh, spectra and to compete with other techniques. And as long as deuteron field cycle relaxometry is not routinely feasible, I showed you some data, but it's not, it's not easily to be done, we should stick to measuring R1 and R2. But the next point is, of course, Applying FTS, uh, applying frequency temperature position is a poor man's approach due to still limited frequency window. So the question is, can we abandon in future to rely on FTS? And this is, of course, the final goal of every, every relaxometry uh, scientific development. And uh, so I show you here only the most recent results which have been collected by Manuel Becher in Darmstadt. And here we clearly see NMR relaxometry grow, goes broadband. 
you see a spectrum at the simple temperature, which covers frequency from, from some hundred hertz to 360 megahertz. So one, two, three, four, five, six, five, six to seven decades in frequency and at measured at one temperature and you get from a fit of that data all you can get from proton NMR, meaning you get the diffusion coefficient, you get the rotational correlation, function, uh, co correlation time, you get the small d, and by that you get uh, the, uh, the, the uh, separation of rotation and translation. And with that outlook, I want to thank you for your attention and say bye-bye. <laughs>